Well, we've been talking this week about um, their system models and a bit about the relationship between integrated assessment models and their system models. So I'm going to talk about that and, and use our group's efforts as an example because that's what I know most talk about. Um, so just show a slide on just the overview of the relationship so far and what's going to, a little bit of what's going to change in the future between the way these interact. And then back up and talk a bit about what is an Earth system model. And we talk about coupling, and there's some um, thing it might be useful to discuss that. Um, what's show you, an Earth system model? What's, what's an integrated assessment model? Saturday morning after a week of sure. meetings. Um, uh, show you, tell you a bit about our model as an example, and then talk about the carbon cycle and land use in our integrated assessment model, because that's really the place where I think there's a lot of potential for coupling, and talk about where to from here. So I don't have a lot of slides, so we can talk and discuss along the way, I hope. Um, hopefully no fruit will be thrown, but, um, so the, what's happened in the past is the assumptions for Earth system models, input assumptions have been generated by integrated assessment models. And previously, say for the SRES, TAR, and AR4, we have socioeconomic assumptions. They're input into the integrated assessment models. They generate emissions. These emissions, some of which go into some intermediate or carbon cycle models, produce concentrations. Those go to GCMs. And then the output of the GCMs goes to impact research. And the line has been pretty linear without a lot of coupling going back so far. And reactive gases and aerosol emissions were gridded in a fairly simple manner to date. So some of the things in the next generation, um, we've talked already about more spatially detailed gridded emissions and land use changes and management as gridded inputs their system models. So I think to do that well, does require more consistency between the integrated assessment models and the Earth system models. And then another interaction is, is going from the end of this all the way back to the beginning. On um, country-based or perhaps even gridded socioeconomic assumptions would be very useful for impacts work. There's been a real difficulty that what came out of SRES was on a four meta region basis. The models actually work on, you know, maybe some from you know 14 to 17 regions. But people work in a specific country or a specific county. So, you know, going from the top to the bottom for a scenario really doesn't work very well. So, ideally, what you want to do is develop those from at least a country level basis up from the start and then really have that connection. Um, and then there's some other connections that I'll talk so, about so going Steve, back. Yeah. Could you, like, if you went through that chain with an example, I mean, socioeconomic. Are there actually socioeconomic models or are these just things you talk about in the socioeconomic well, community? Well, there's, for demographics, there's certainly dem models of demographics. And the demographic model that is used, I mean, it's very simple. You know, people do, you have life, you know, age ranges, people die, you have death rates, and it's a matter of what you assume about those death rates and so on going forward. Um, one of the key parameters is the fertility rate. And what's happened so far, and, and I think it was talked about earlier, I don't know if that was talked about here, but maybe it's over a beer. But what has happened is that Fertility rate in developed countries has, by and large, fallen below replacement level in quite a bit. And the demographers basically quite couldn't believe that. So what's happened over the last 10 years is every time they had a projection for fertility rates, the real world undershot it. So now the demographers are actually saying, well, you know, maybe this is real. <laughs> so, you know, people just aren't having, you know, 2.1 average kids per woman, you know, that's a demographic sort of fiction. I mean, it's the magical number that's replacement, but, you know, nobody goes around thinking, well, if I had my 2.1 kids, you know, I mean, that just doesn't, that's not the way the dynamics works in the real world. So it's an interesting, um, interesting thing. So, you know, really it's a matter of these assumptions. Now for the socioeconomics, that one, <laughs> there's hardly a model. It's just by assumption. And we just don't understand, you know, that very well. I mean, it's a fairly solid prediction to say that you know, GDP will continue to rise or, or, in, in, or GDP per capita in developed countries. Although even there, I mean, not to pick on any one country, but, you know, Japan has had a lot of trouble coming out of a recession because of various issues, which, you know, some, you know, some people claim, they say, well, if you do this, it'll work. But of course, you know, sometimes you do these things and they don't work. So it, it's, not, it's not well understood. Then you get to the real issue for, for future emissions, and that's what's going to happen in developing countries. And there we definitely don't understand, you know, how to predict this. I mean, that's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And then there's connections between those two. And it's, it's clear that at higher incomes, fertility goes down. But fertility can go down without an increase of income as well. So that's one of those things that, 
we can construct scenarios that we can all people can look at them and say, well, I think that's broadly a consistent scenario that could happen, but in terms of doing that connection mechanistically, we don't have that down. So that's where it gets to where being able to predict is actually quite difficult. Mackie was telling me that migration was very crudely represented if represented at all in yeah. this sort of model. That's right. Um, actually, we some of the models have migration. Demographic models have migration, but it's not. Um, there needs improvement. I mean, we had a problem where the the projections used for the SRES didn't have migration for the U.S., and that's a huge change to our populations. The future U.S. population projection just was wrong. So it's something that definitely needs to be, even just getting something consistent with current data is, is a step, and I think that that's probably happening. Um, but then trying to understand how that might change, um, and it's actually, actually that's closely tied with um, GDP. Because if you look, you know, what, what is the labor force going to look like as you go into the future? And the U.S. has a very def different profile demographically than Europe, where we have our labor force as a fraction of the population is not going to shrink nearly as much over the next years. And then Japan actually is the extreme example where their workforce, working population is decreasing, you know, relative to the total population. And that's an issue with Social Security and, you know, future income. And that's, you know, people... Really, you know, there's just this wide open what's going to happen. I mean, no, I don't think it's one so directly tied to the, the, the magnitude of migration. That's part of it. Well, that and the fertility, those are combined. And then the relative fertility of the mig migrate, you know, people, um, immigrants versus the native population and the way that converges over time. So there's a lot of interesting things going on there. These socioeconomic quote unquote models or projections take climate change into effect? No. Because you know they're they're crude enough as it is, so you know sort of adding, you know some, the fact that's less you know we know there's even bigger things we don't understand, you know than that. So yeah. So just asking somebody was giving a talk and somebody asked him about well can you could you simulate with some socioeconomic models could you have simulated the 20th century if you gave it pre-industrial conditions kind of like we do with the, the yeah. uh, these AOGCMs? And they well, said, well it would be impossible because who could have anticipated two world wars in the 20th century? And so there's those kinds of things that also can uh, cause problems with the uh, computer. Well, let me let me actually go to this next slide because this hits at some of these issues. And this is actually some of you may have seen this similar version of the slide before. But let me just talk about what these models do and I'll get right back to this question. So these are tools for actually... In, in our community, it's long-term analysis, but there are any great assessments you can do for, for different time scales. And the goal is to combine information from different disciplines in the one framework. You know, the example I use is the goal of our model is not to figure out what the climate sensitivity is. You know, that's an input parameter. And then the goal of our model is to figure out what are implications of the climate sensitivity if it's this number or that number. So the same is true for other pieces of the system. Um, each model makes different trade-offs between completeness and complexity and modeling approaches, depending on the purpose. So we have quite a heterogeneity of, of different types of models. And, that's all, and I'll show a slide on that. But that's very different, too, because all the Earth system models, you're essentially all doing the same thing. I mean, you know, in, in, in the ways that you're doing it differently you know, are, are relatively modest compared to some of the differences here. So, um, and these are not truth machines. I mean, they're, they're not predictive. I, you know, we can't forecast many of the most important factors, such as technology or social, human socioeconomic developments. And, you know, there are, or, well, wars are something that, if you look at the time series, the war's a blip. I mean, it's sort of like, wars are like volcanoes. You know, I mean, on the long term, you know, it changed, you know, may change the long term average ever so slightly. But, you know, you see a blip. And then, you know, you look at software, I have the like, historical software emissions reconstruction that some of you have seen. And you see the wars, then, you know, it just keeps on, you know, it's not like the war happens and then there's a state change. There wasn't. The war happened, everybody went back to what they were doing before. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it may affect the long it may affect the long term average rate slightly, but that's just a matter of what you what you assume for the long term rate. But the perturbation in that is much smaller than um, things like will Africa successfully develop economically, or will Latin America successfully get out of the state it's in economically and develop in a different path. You know, those changes are far more important than the economic effect of of even even the world wars. And what happens, there's an offsetting effect because, you know, Europe's economy was devastated, but America revved up. 
So you have offsetting effects, and you see that in the emissions. European emissions dropped, and American emissions popped up. So you have those sort of offsets as well. So, I mean, I'm not saying war is good. I mean, in some sense, war can be good for the economy in, in, in a way, but it's not good for the people. Um, so there is this issue of getting long-term, you know, some long-term scenario. But I think there's also the issue of how can we predict these changes. And particularly, as I'll show in a bit, one of our focuses in our group is looking at technology. And there, you know, I don't, you can't predict, you know, in 2050, will fusion be economic? Well, it'll probably still be 20 years away. But, um, you know, I mean, those are things you really can't predict. I mean, if, if it does become economic, there are things given that that you understand in terms of economies of scale and so on. But whether the fundamental breakthrough will happen, let, let, let you actually do it, well, you know, well, I don't know. So, but these are useful tools. So one of the things we do is we examine possible futures with different assumptions for energy technologies, economic growth rates, carbon cycle, and so on. And thereby, you end up producing emission scenarios. Although in general, this is not the primary activity of these models. So we actually, the primary thing we do is not generate emission scenarios, although it is a significant activity. Um, and we can look at the relative cost of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions reductions under different scenarios for technology and policy. And that's, that's something that we do quite a bit in our group. Um, and that's one of the purposes of our work is that the government has a research portfolio and they're interested in, well, where are places for this issue of climate change would be best to put our research dollars. And we try to give some insight into you know, what things may be more useful than others or just the, how things might play out. This, then, this is an interesting aspect of this because you know, when, you, when you hear different people say things, you know, some people say if, you know, to reduce emissions we have this gigantic economic cost. And then other, like some states have actually costed it out and it's not that Big yeah. deal. And in fact, there are positive aspects to doing it. Is, is those are the kind of things you can kind of clarify? Yeah. Or, or is it, yeah. I mean, is it just people, are there just kind of these rash assumptions that for some reason the U.S. says that there'd be this gigantic economic cost? Well, there are a lot of rash assumptions out there. I'd like to hope that they're not coming from our group. Right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things people say, and some of them are, are, are just not true. I mean, that's, that's just the, the nature of this. And um, and a lot of it's because people don't define what their problem is. So the cost of emissions reductions is directly proportional to how much you reduce. So that's one aspect and the time scale over which you do it. So um, the work in the integrated assessment community in the energy economic community, which is the core, has been the core of that, is that you know, there are certain criteria for um, you know, minimizing the cost. You want an economically efficient policy in terms of spreading the burden according to your goal equally across the economy. Um, most of the policies that come up don't actually do that. <laughs> they're, they're sort of tweaked one way or the other. Um, you want uniform participation across the globe, but you know, we don't see that. But that's, you know, that, that's, and then you want, the key thing is in terms of technology is you want a carbon price. You, you need to have a price for carbon. That's key. You can't just do it if you just want to do it and you don't really make that a cost one way or the other. You need to have a carbon tax and there are certain communities where we can't use the T word. Um, so, um, so it's a carbon price um, and whether that's a, carb, you know, a tax or a carbon permit system, trading system, that doesn't matter economically if you do it efficiently. So you want a price and you want the rate rise at a predictable rate over time. And that's not the situation we have now. We have Kyoto and it stops. And I mean, we're going to learn a lot from doing Kyoto. There's no doubt about that. And there were some real reductions that will take place. But then it stops. So there's projects that would go in, online now, but they say, well, we can't get any credit for it because this project really only kicks in after 2010. So you need that predictability so that actors in the economy, you know, industrial actors and others can say, well, look, this is, this is going to cost more and more over time. You know, I can choose to do what I need, do change now don't change what I do now and pay later, or I can, you know, change now, you know, I can do whatever's optimal for me, but, but that will, but we don't have those conditions as yet. So that's the type of insights that we try to provide. Well, well California just announced this very ambitious program, you know, Schwarzenegger and talking right. to Tony Blair, and there was just something in the New York Times about this, I think, yesterday. Um, so they, they're going to try to target get to 1990 levels by 2025 or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I presume they're using these kinds of models to get, kind of quantify exactly what would have to happen, right? Um, well, <laughs> probably not exactly. It's more, 
of a hodgepodge of analysis, um, but uh, you know they put together a bunch of. But, but California actually is one of the larger funders of climate research. I mean, California Energy Commission is, as many of you know, they have a large research budget for this. So they have, fun and they actually are one of our funders. So they do hear from us on these things. So it's true. But they, you know, we didn't do. I don't think any. I'm not sure who did an explicit analysis. They put together a portfolio of things, but you know that's 20 years in the future, and California has. Um, unlike the rest of the country, they have, they have experience um, in doing this in that while the rest of the country per capita electricity use has gone up um, over the last couple, 20 years, in California it's been flat. So, you know, they say, well, we can do things differently, and that's for two reasons. One, they aggressively pursued energy efficiency, and they have higher energy prices. And what's happened in the rest of the country, we, sort of, we slacked off on pursuing energy efficiency, except in a few states. Some of the states are starting to catch up because the federal government has really backed off on that. Um, and uh, until recently, we've had relatively low energy prices, and now they're spiking up for various reasons. Didn't they do something that whereby the profits from the power companies weren't necessarily tied just to how much power was used? Uh, they were also somehow tied to the efficiencies as well. Yeah, there's a way to do that. There's there's things you can do to that to encourage efficiency. I think California did that. Uh, yeah. Five, five things. yeah, that's one of the ways you could help fund efficiency. Yeah. Right. So. And they have a, a secret weapon in Art Rosenfeld. <laughs> right. Who's that? He's a somewhat retired professor, but he's on the California Energy Commission and is a tremendous advocate of. Efficiency. And the, the Department of Energy just, just uh, got the Eureka Fermi Award from the Department of Energy, which is somewhat ironic. But, um, so basically, the, the, one of the goals is what are the important linkages between these, pe between these pieces? So when we create a piece of our model, what um, you know, I want to look for is to have sort of the right overall dynamics so this can interact with the other pieces. And, and in a sense, it's like modeling of a chaotic system. You can have very, you can have simple components, but they interact in a complex way. Um, and then what are the lever points where you can make a big difference in changing, for example, emissions or lowering costs? And economics plays a central role in pretty much all the integrated assessment models. So they're all very economically based. So there's there is this tension sometimes between the bottom up analysis where energy efficiency people might say, well, there's you know this much we can do, and then the top down analysis says, well, you know, it doesn't look like that in the real world. And what we've been trying to do is sort of meld those two, where you build in more bottom-up detail at the technology level in terms of refrigerators and furnaces and, you know, building shell characteristics. And then we have that within the overall economic framework where prices respond and, and we have su supplies and demands responding to each other. So how um, extensive are those macroeconomic models. They, let me let me uh, try to get to that over the next couple of slides because I will actually. So so this is actually a slide largely stolen from my talk uh, last um, earlier this week, but it, it's comparing the way biomass is is um, biomass is in these three models. So EPA is the MIT model, Image is the the Netherlands group, and then our model is the Objects Minicam, which I'll talk a bit more about in, in a minute. And so each of these has very different approaches in, all over the board and what they do. Um, they have different approaches to this particular problem of biomass and technology. All three of them incorporate competition for land, for growing biomass, because that's a key element of if you want to grow biomass, it's got to compete with crops for land. But they do it in a very different way. Um, and sort of going from left to right, this model is what's called a general equilibrium model, the one that they use for the energy portion. So it's got a lot of economics connections in it, but it has doesn't have specific technology detail. It's more of an aggregate approach. Then you get to these models, and they have more in terms of specific technologies, and you go across the image, then they also have this explicit gridded land use that they look at. So um, there's more economics over there, you know, more spatial detail here. And in some sense, we are actually sort of in the middle with a bit of both. So um, it really varies quite a bit. So I, I, maybe you had another piece of your question that I can answer. I'm not quite sure how to answer that in terms of, because they are, can, can be very different. Well, I, I took Macroeconomics 101. And that, <laughs> that's the extent mm -hmm. of it. And, um, and I was uh, surprised by how simplistic 
many of those models mm -hmm. were. I mean, they're and coming from physics. They were just a couple of equations. Right. And even those were not very well known, and, and they didn't seem to. They seem to work half of the time, and half of the time they had no idea. And so, so is it is it still kind of the level? I mean, I, I might. Well, be, it, it varies quite a bit, and. Now, all these models tend to have its long-term economics we're looking at. So these models don't deal with unemployment. They don't have recessions. You know, so it's not resolved at that time scale. So generally, economic growth is something that's more or less prescribed in one way or the other. Um, for example, we would prescribe, we, we have a demographic trajectory which tells you about the workforce. We make some assumptions about the age range over which people are in the workforce. And then we prescribe the rate of labor productivity growth. In other words, how many dollars per you know person work hours are produced, and that's a prescription because no one quite understands how to you know that's not really modeled on a fundamental level. But then there's different levels of detail in terms of once you prescribe that, how much coal do you need to pr or oil or energy do you need to produce a car, and then how much is that car driven? You know those are also economic um, variables and that are, are important in this context. So. This has a very different formulation than like this or this one does in that. So those are very quite a bit. And some of them, um, in some sense, this is probably the simplest one economically, and that one is the most complex, but there are trade-offs with that. So once you get beyond that level, you can get quite a bit of complexity. So for example, in this model, um, if you're producing ethanol from biomass, it's there's not an explicit ethanol technology. It's, it's just sort of... But there's a liquid fuel that you can use, and biomass is one of the factors of production you can use to do that. And it's got labor and capital and land, and they all sort of flow back from each other um, in a pretty seamless and continuous manner. You can shift across those different inputs to produce fuel. And that's the economic paradigm that they're using. Um, whereas, you know, we have something very different where, you know, you, you have an explicit technology with an efficiency to produce ethanol. So it's there's different levels of details once you get at the bottom. But I'll show you more about ours, and that may give you a little bit better sense. Um, but basically, the two bottom line is that there are quite different approaches. But the other thing is, a number of the modeling groups are moving toward you, more use of geographically explicit information in their models, although not in a fully coupled mode. You have to make trade-offs in doing that. So, so when you say these are, are gridded, I mean, does that mean, is this a kind of a GCM type thing where you're actually calculating things at each grid point? Well, you cap, um, well, in this one, they have a trust, they use TEM, but it's not coupled with the economics. So TEM just gives the response to rising CO2 concentrations. So there's no coupling at all between them at this point. So it's like a, it's like a land, like a land model would be in a GCM. And right. It's responding to. Yeah, it's actually TEM. It's, it's, um, you know, um, yeah. It's what? Uh, Jerry Malone's group. Yeah. It's their model actually that they use, but it's just, it just has fixed land use and it doesn't interact with the economics. Um, on the other hand, Image has gridded land use, you know, over time and they have agricultural production and that's changing by grid cell. It's a one by one Greek grid cell over the world. But then they have a model called Timer, which is the energy component, energy economics component. And they iterate back and forth between them a few times to get, for example, they have, they use the image gridded model to figure out, well, if if biomass price was, the, if you were willing to pay this much for biomass, how much land could you plant biomass plantations? If the carbon price was this much, how much land would you just plant, grow trees just to store carbon? And then they iterate back and forth a bit. So it's not fully coupled, but you do have some interaction. And then what we do is somewhat in the middle where we don't have a gridded model, but I'll show you what we do is we have more aggregate categories. We have gridded data we want to input, and then we have more tight economic um, uh, coupling between the economics and the land. So is it kind of like, you know, GCM, the land would be responding to temperature precipitation, but here the land is responding to economics and right. other things. So what, what they do is, for example, you have population scenarios and income scenarios, and from that you, you drive some relationship of how much food people will demand. And then that, that relates to a demand for food, and then you have productivity of different pieces of land. You have to supply that food. So we all assume, tend to assume that comes first, that there's very little, you know, people want to eat regardless of climate or anything else. Then you say, well, we've used this much land for food, for pasture and so on. Then if we want to grow biomass for energy, what land could be used for that or for carbon? And then that, that you develop some sort of simple representation supply curves for that. And that goes into the energy model. And so there is an interaction with that.
I've heard Colin Prentice talk about building building models which could actually sort of work online in, inter in, in an interactive fashion for some of these things. But for example, if a particular region, if the precip went away in 2020, mm -hmm. then you might not be able to use agricultural right. land to do something. Well, how, how do you build a response and, to this kind of a change and, into and the system? More, more general question is, to what extent is water a player in these different aspects? It depends on the model. We don't have water at all, which is a limitation. We're essentially assuming it's not changing. Um, they do. I think they have some of that in here, and I'm, I'm not. I don't know as much about their model. And actually, I'll mention the Yasa modeling is is actually at this point getting to be fairly analogous to this, where they have detailed offline models to do agriculture and forestry, and then they input summary results into their energy model and sort of iterate back and forth. So that's a key issue. I mean, it's tough. So um, one of the things you can do is if I have a climate change scenario with precipitation changes and I have inputs into my model for water availability, then you know I can run without it, I can run with it and see what differences run in, go in. And so that's sort of what we want to definitely be able to head toward, but we're not there yet. So under these circumstances, you just assume that sort of the physical system is staying the same throughout. You'll allow other aspects of the, so right. of, of the driving forces to right. evolve. But right, and that's and, and, and these 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 ones actually have more ability to do that, like the image and Yasu. So they, I think they do have the ability to have some of that change, and I'm not sure how they're exer how far along they are in exercising that at this point. But there's some that is definitely is a clear issue. Um, Go ahead. So, so anyway, that's. Well, I know that you know, we've done some experiments where we took you know, image apparently produced these land use changes over time right. for the I think. Couple of the SRES scenarios, all of them, yeah, for all of them, mm -hmm. yeah. So, were they using any? I guess they weren't using any climate information. They were just using not sure. economic information and, and changing it in I'm, ways that. that you I'm not certain and, but yeah. if they're using that or not. Yeah, but as you know, water just including water, water is a challenge just across the board. Obviously, it's a challenge to you know even just predict or you know get get it right in the present day, but it's also a challenge economically because water actually is not. You know, you go for a market and you buy coal, you know, water is allocated to it used in a very different way and it's not done in an economically rational sense and it's very regional. So it's very challenging to figure out how to how to do that. So that's definitely on um, many of our plates to think about that and figure out how to bring that in in a better way. But it's just, you know, it's challenging and overall the history of this field is that it started with energy economics. So energy economic component of these models you know, our model goes back to a model that Jay Edmonds and John Riley um, and Dave Barnes put together probably almost 25 years ago. And the core concepts have, are actually much the same. We've elaborated on it and improved it. You know, agriculture and land use, you know, has just started much later. So it's, it's, it's a harder problem and, it, and we've been working at it not as long. So it's, it's, it's tougher with that. I know one of the problems we had when we started using this image land use is that it was for present day, their land use types were quite a bit different from what we were already using, which may have been Rem, Cody, and Foley or something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And apparently this is why, because they've made these different assumptions about economics and how it's affecting present day land use, I guess, is that why? Well, and it may, that, I mean, those are, the other thing is that there's just these data delays. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a relatively recent work to update, you know, gridded information on cropland, you know, which is uncertain, of course, but he, you know, done, they've done a very good job. Um, with what they what they had available, um, and of course, you know, it's a big deal to change your underlying assumptions in any model. And the more complicated the model it is, the harder it is to change what you're using. So our approach has been to have less complication, but then more ability to be flexible. But that limits some of the detail we can look at. So it's a real it's a real trade off. So well, that was one of the real frustrating things about this is that just by using different so-called present-day land use mm -hmm. data sets, we got as big a change in the climate yeah. as we got from future changes right. in, within one land use data right. set. So it's kind of you know, one of those signal, really frustrating signal and noise things from the climate point of view. Right. That really so actually, I'm going to come back and I'm going to try to come back to that, actually. Yeah. So, um, so let me just talk a little bit about what, what we do, and not in too much detail, but we, we have our modeling is now done within what we call the Object-Oriented Energy, Climate, and Technology Systems Framework. So this is in C++, so it's an object-oriented code. And that really allows us a lot of flexibility in, in expand, expand, expanding the code and uh, allowing us to develop much more quickly. 
We use XML extensible markup language for our data and model interfaces. Um, and it runs 10 to 60 seconds on a reasonably new PC. So that's sort of our time scale for going out 100 years. And we have version control and archiving. We have maybe six to eight staff and students concurrently working on the code development, although like that includes me and I spend very little time actually doing any code anymore. So that's, you know, it's, it's a relatively small group. It's, you know, pretty much, you know, you have subsets of your models that have more people working on it than, you know, we do. So when you say 10 to 60 seconds, what time frame is that? And what are you simulating? Generally? Going over a hundred years, years. Mm -hmm, for the, you know, the, to produce like an SRES scenario. So basically you use the model to examine how we go from today's energy systems. So this is 19, a graph of 1990 energy use. And each of these boxes is an economic sector in the model. So these are resource sectors that are producing primary resources. These are transformation sectors for the energy system. They're taking these resources and transforming them into different goods. And then these are demand sectors that are using these goods to provide services. And so basically, we have our input data determines all these connections and the nature of the sectors. So we just change the input data to change the structure of the model. So we don't change model code to do that. If we want a sector that behaves in a different way, then we change the model code and we, we derive a new sector from what's already there. So that limits their, the amount we have to change things. So the definition of the model is actually determined by the data more than the code, although the code limits what you can do, of course. Because another sector is the code? What's that? Um, well, they're all there. They, they're all there in the beginning, but they may not be operating. Like they don't exist yet. So yes, in, in a sense, yes. So hydrogen doesn't exist as a, it's you know it's in the input data sector data set, but it's turned off you know in 1990 because we know historically it didn't exist at least in, in large forms. Let me show you. Steve? Yeah. So, so you have some, something, something like that or, or something like that. And um, so what what is what is your main point? Is it is it basically you're trying to optimize with constraint the energy use. What, what, what is the overlying you're, question? Right. That so the underlying thing that the model solves for is you're trying to supply a set of services at a, a lowest cost. So and what the, the fundamental paradigm of the model is, and let me just say, so this, this answers your question as well. This is goes to, this is in one scenario, 2095 US energy flows. So now we have new sectors. We have hydrogen as a sector. This is, um, and so that's now operating and, and using resources and providing services using hydrogen. Um, and there's, there's been shifts in the sector. So biomass is much more important now. Um, instead of, uh, there's actually a very small amount of conventional crude oil because by this point you've, run, you've used up the uh, conventional crude oil. Now you're using unconventional oils like shale oils instead. So, which with large emissions consequences. So the model is trying to provide these services at the lowest cost. So, and it's, there's a demand for passenger transportation. And given that demand, there's different technologies. You can use hydrogen fuel vehicles, electric fuel vehicles. Those aren't shown at this slice of the model. And the model says, well, what combination of, of technologies can supply that service at the lowest cost? And then there's an iteration because if I wanna use more um, petroleum burning cars, I have to produce more petroleum, which is going to cost more. And there's an iteration in price as you go back and forth to meet the supplies and demands. So that's really the fundamental thing. Then if we have a carbon constraint, that's just another price. And we have a carbon price and we say, well, we want to keep emissions to this level, below this level. And then we change the carbon price until the system adjusts to where emissions are at that level. So as the system adjusts, electricity is the first thing to adjust to using no car to emitting little carbon because it's got the most options. You can you can switch to wind, solar, nuclear, you can burn coal but put the carbon in the ground, and all that's consistently solved for to find the lowest cost solution to meet whatever constraints. Are there assumptions about government intervention? For example, if this was sugar, would you mm -hmm. have a government subsidy or limitation on imports of sugar? I mean, is it assumed that it's a basically free market or are there restrictions? Yeah, that's, um, that's always an interesting question. And to some extent, when we calibrate to base your data, whatever governments are doing are in there. And if there's an explicit subsidy that we want to change in the future, we need to sort of pull that out, and then we could change that over time. Um, and that's, for example, we don't actually have sugar ethanol in there now because it's actually it's not going to come in in the future, but we actually will 
we'll add that in and we're gonna, we'll have to add a subsidy because otherwise it would look. Um, our default assumption is to tend to assume that whatever subsidies are there tend to go away over time. But um, how about the um, the stocks like the uranium, uranium? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you treat the stocks in relation to energy available as right. well as price? Right. So actually, these resource sectors all operate well. At least the the fossil ones and uranium operate on a resource model where there is a specific stock and different grades of resource. So there's different grades of uranium and if you use the cheaper uranium you have to get more uranium. And we actually have a version that has a much more detailed full nuclear um, fuel cycle where you can have breeder reactors and you know I think thorium is now in it and so on. So all that sort of thing can be in there. And the same is true for oil, gas, and coal. And that's why by 2095 you're using shale oil and not crude oil because you've used up the resource of crude oil. If you have a carbon policy and you reduce oil use, that still happens, but you tend to push that out in time a little bit. So essentially, you pretty much use all the conventional oil you know, you can't, you, that's out there is to, that you assume is available in a century, regardless of the policy. Because even if you have a climate policy, you know, Petroleum fuel is just still going to be the most efficient, the cheapest, and most convenient way to, to fuel personal vehicles for a long time, and it, it will be used. So. Has the projection for easily available oil changed much over time? There is a lot of debate on that, <laughs> and there's there's whole meetings. We had a meeting on peak oil, which I finally understand what the peak. There's there's actually people that model peak oil, and they do a separate type of modeling. So I actually finally understand what they're doing now because we had this meeting. But there's a lot of debate on that. Um, it's, it's some of the, the problem is well, there's, there's a problem of definition and the definitions have changed so it's very hard to compare over time. So there's a, it's a real issue. But the bottom line is really that there's a lot of fossil fuels on this planet. I mean there's just lots of hydrocarbons out there in different forms. And what happens is what we call you know conventional oil now, there are things that were unconventional 10 years ago that now are just a matter of course. They just, you know, extract them now all the time. So, you know, we're not going to run out of fossil fuels. You know, running out of fossil fuels is not going to reduce emissions. I mean, that, that, that's not going to drive a reduction in emission because there's just, you know, there's, there's enough coal out there for several hundred years. There's, you know, if you manage to get into gas hydrates, that's a tremendous resource. And, you know, there's people out there at the oil company who say, well, we could just about do that now. Or some people claim they could do it now. And if gas prices stay high, they will go out and do it. So there's a lot of, so that's sort of the fundamental problem is, is we're not going to run out of resources and that's not going to solve the problem for us. We actually have to actively do something if we want to reduce the amount of carbon we're transferring from the fossil reservoirs to the atmosphere. Is there a way you can do a model verification exercise like running the last 10 years to see if any of these things actually work? Yeah, and that's actually, it's been tough to do because we calibrate the history for two things, two reasons. One, we calibrate the history. So, um, and the historical data doesn't go back. We don't have really good historical data going back 50 years. It gets more and more aggregate as you go back. So you have to have some data to calibrate with, and then you're not really left with anything to verify against. And then the model structures were ri so rigid that we really couldn't, it wasn't feasible. So we're actually getting to the point where our flexible structure, we're actually, we would like to run some of the history. And even if you run the history in calibrated mode, you can look at these calibration parameters that are in there and see, you know, if they're relatively constant, you're like, good, we got it. If they change a lot, then you're like, okay, we didn't capture something. So that is something that's, that um, is of great interest and it's just a matter of time and, you know, students working on part of that now and making great progress, so, you know. <laughs> Slaves. <laughs> well, we do pay them. We pay them pretty well. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work by uh, Jason West. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so what he did was to do something comparable to what you're doing with carbon, but looking at the methane and the impact on pollution, and so the number of deaths that maybe violated right. it, and how at some point reducing methane emissions would actually um, alleviate all, right. the, all those deaths, and so would be uh, <clears throat> good for the society, right. even on an economic mm -hmm. level. Is there any uh, attempt in doing something similar to that, adding instead of just a price of carbon, right. the price of lives. Well, we have we have the first part of that. We certainly have methane, we have all the greenhouse gas emissions and trace gases and they interact. So we have a simple formulation. Um, let's see, I think it's Wigley, Smith and Prather, you know, in some journal. 
right? So we did actually have this simple from OxComp where we, so methane, changing methane emissions do affect ozone, but we were looking at sort of global, you know, average ozone, because we were pretty interested in the forcing. So we have that forcing effect. So the next step is, well, we need a way of having, you know, sort of a reduced or inversion of relationships to have emissions and local ozone and perhaps impacts. So there is an interest in that. I mean, we don't, we don't have that at present, but that would be an interesting thing to do. And that gets back to, and you'll see it on a later slide, is even before we do that, you know, I'm not even sure if what I have in there for emissions control assumptions for ozone precursors are reasonable. So what I really want to look at, and, and I think you, you're the type of person that can help over the next years is, you know, we, we can look at, if we can look at pollution levels, you know, ozone levels in different world regions for scenarios, you know, we can look at the underlying uh, assumptions for economic growth, and we can start to see if there's consistency. You know, while, while I can't, look at history, you actually can sort of predict that, you know, as incomes rise, people are going to control pollution more. Now, ozone is troublesome. You know, we, we're not, we're struggling with that in worldwide. It's hard to control. But eventually, presumably, we'll get it under control. So if you assume that that's going to happen, you can start to look at consistency and say, well, look, China in this scenario in 2050 is at this income level, and they're still suffering this level of pollution, which is just not consistent. You know, at that income level, you would have the resources to deal with it. But on ozone, you know, it's so localized and nonlinear. I don't know whether the assumptions we've made or other groups have made are really self-consistent. So I think if we could get to the point first to see if our assumptions are self-consistent, on just the base case. I think that's really critical. And then we can go move on to say, well, in the policy case, you get some additional reductions because you reduce the greenhouse gases. And then we can look at the impacts as well. So there's a lot of interesting things to do there. Wasn't that what happened to sulfate aerosols is that uh, there was a quality of life assumption in there, but in the, like in ice 92A, that if you're going to India and China, you're going to be burning all this coal. So there's going to be this gigantic increase in sulfate aerosols, yeah. but then later on people realize, yeah, but that's going to cause these huge environmental right. problems and acid rain. So they'll probably come up with, because of quality of life or other environmental issues, they come up with. Right, right. And, and so basically, if you look in uh, Smith et al. in Climatic Change from last year, I think, or a couple of years ago, um, that was, um, actually, that was named one of the reasons I was brought in to work on the SRES was I'd done this work on software controls. And um, so I wrote a lot of the, con at that point we got a lot of, uh, there was an attack on the SRES due to, well, this is unrealistic. It's like, well, no, it isn't. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. are quality of life issues. Right? right, exactly. And and software is one that's readily, you, you can control that fairly easily. I mean, it's done. And, and we have history, and there's a graph in my paper where I, where I track the aggregate emissions reduction fraction um, as a function of income for U.S., Europe, China. I mean, U.S., Europe, Japan. And, you know, you see that, you know, you see this as income goes up, um, you know, the emissions reduction goes up as well at some point. So, but the point at which it starts is not always clear. But, you know, when China gets to a certain income, they're not going to have software emissions. I mean, large software emissions. It's just right now they're strong. They have many, there's too much competition for what resources are available. So they're not scrubbing, you know, all the power plants or actually any of them. But. You know, that will happen eventually. So there is a consistency condition there that, that's important. So software, it's rather easy because the local impacts are fairly proportional emissions, even though there's, you know, it's more complicated. But over a long term, that's a pretty good assumption. So, you know, I can do that and be fairly confident that, you know, my scenario is fairly cons internally consistent. But I don't have that level of confidence for what, you know, I've assumed for the ozone precursors. So. So. Final topic, take a look at carbon cycle and land use in an integrated assessment model. So we actually have a project to improve our carbon cycle and land use, but this is a bit of a hodgepodge slide, but let me th first look at this graph. What this graph is, the thin lines are carbon cycle projections for the B2 scenario. These are from the TAR, from two intermediate complexity models, BURN and ISAM. So ISAM is a Toll Jane's model and BURN model. Um, it's supports about use. And then the, the, the thick blue lines are MAGIC, basically, simulations from the MAGIC model, which you're all quite familiar with, I'm sure, for the carbon cycle over the century. And basically, in a broad scale, you know, this much simpler model is able to produce the range of responses to the carbon cycle. So that's one of our key, you know, the, the, these other models are, are 
are great models and they do useful things, but they're too complex for us. They take too long and it's too hard to, you know, that's, that's just, we need something simpler. So what we require our components to be, we need them to be fast. You know, we need to run multiple scenarios in 10 minutes, not 10 hours or days or years or <laughs> something. So um, we need to be flexible. Um, the, the one, you know, the Earth system models basically tend to give you one answer. And you know, each model has, version has a climate sensitivity, you know, which is great. Now it would be great. Now if they all agreed, that would be the end of it. But of course they don't. So for our work, we need to be flexible because we do need to be able to represent these uncertainties. And we want it to be as transparent as possible so we can communicate the key assumptions we've made to actually get our ranges so people can understand, you know, what the implications of these assumptions are. So what we're working toward, um, and this is a mo I have to show a box model of, you know, at some point. So here it is. It's a, it's a bunch of modelers, right? So this is sort of the, the idea of the integrated assessment framework. So we have socioeconomic and technological assumptions. Now in our model, we actually, uh, we make assumptions about the availability of technology over time, whether it's cost and performance characteristics. And then the model then calculates how much it's used, makes an estimate of that. We have um, physical system assumptions, such as carbon cycle or um, climate changes, which interact a little bit now, but not as much as they should. So this is what we're building now. Um, and then, of course, this was a NASA-funded project, so remote sensing data is the key to all of this, um, of course. And, and then, of course, uh, we can actually go back the other way and use some of this data, these gridded data sets to um, produce better gridded emission scenarios. And the link, the core of this model is the energy economic system and another big piece is agriculture and land use. And the link is biomass. I mean, that is the primary link between um, the energy economic system and the agriculture and land use economics. And then here the link is in the land use changes and carbon consequences when you get to the carbon cycle. So right now we have a model where we have, we do have interaction between the carbon cycle and land use changes, but the land use changes are regional, the carbon cycle is global. So that's not consistent. So what we're building is consistent regional models of linked land use and the carbon cycle. So we have consistent regional carbon cycle. And the idea is that we can take inputs from our system models to calibrate that. We can so I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that would look like in a, in a moment. Steve, what is a carbon consequence? Um, well, if you, for example, if you have, as you have land use change, then if you expand amount of agricultural land in South America, you're going to result in deforestation, and that's a carbon emissions consequence. If you change your management pra practice for agriculture to no-till, you store more carbon in the soil, that's one of the carbon consequences of those changes. Um, if you have a, some reference case scenario and then you add more biomass and you cause more deforestation because you're converting land to biomass plantations, um, that's a consequence. Maybe it could even be you know, a positive consequence if you put biomass on land that was, didn't have as much carbon before. But there's, I'm not, that, that's maybe an unrealistic assumption. That's something that needs to be considered. How do you use the magic sentence? Um, Matt, right now we mostly use magic as, as, for example, in what you saw before where magic produces global mean temperature changes. So, for example, we might, we would have a scenario where we want to limit CO2 concentrations to a certain level, and I'll show that in a minute. Um, and then magic is used to take the emissions and convert them into concentrations. We did a set of runs, actually it would have been good to show that graph, but it's not in here, where we uh, stabilized climate change at two degrees. Um, sort of the European target, and then looked at different technology assumptions and how much does it cost to do that, or the economic implications of different technologies being available or not. So, and I think for this, and, and it's been tough to, with global carbon cycle and sort of an aggregate land use model, it was sort of tough to link some of this together. So I think in, in developing a framework where we have these gridded data sets as input, um, you know, my goal in this is to make it easier to try to link these together and also to update it. Because if you have a gridded data set and a system for bringing that data into the model as parameters or input assumptions or whatnot, then, you know, if you update the data set, you just plug in a new data set and go. So that's, that's really what I'm trying to do. So let me show you the level we operate. And this is, um, 
So we have a, still a fairly aggregated or regionally consistent model of the carbon cycle, agriculture, and land use. So this is sort of our economic land allocation tree. So we start with all the land in a region that's, that's potentially usable for agriculture. Um, one of the things we're setting out now is we're sort of part setting aside in one sort of land nest, um, rangeland and grazing land that's not well suitable for agriculture. And then we have different lands, um, managed land groups, various crops, including biomass, um, you know, high quality pasture that can easily substitute for cropland, managed forest land, forests that are managed for timber production. And then these blue boxes are the unmanaged lands that in a sense, this is, little, this is most of the carbon cycle feedbacks here, particularly in the forest, of course. So the idea is that we can have any number of these boxes as makes sense and is computationally tractable. I mean, we're not going to have 50. But what we want to do experiments on once we have these systems set up is that um, we could have just one aggregate unmanaged land box with sort of the average carbon content, see what that looks like, you know, split it into three split it into a number of forests, you know, to start to see at what point do you get diminishing returns and you get a reasonable cycle out. Is this um, going on on a, a global grid and you're looking at no. regions or you have this regional is, boxes? This is regional boxes. So that you'd have, you would have this, say, for the U.S. And then it's a question within the U.S., since it's a big region, do we want to break out sort of certain types of forests that have different characteristics? You know, for Canada and Russia, we would definitely have boreal, you know, forests separated out from other forests. And they actually might be, you might have some of those in another box over here where you have no management going on in many of those, but you just have the carbon cycle implications. Um, we can actually take, you know, say, uh, land preserves and put them aside. And that, that's where all these gridded data sets really help. There are all these maps of managed land, if you believe them. I mean, some of them don't, are only on paper, but you, know, you could put them aside and not have them participate in this, but still have carbon cycle feedback. So, um, So just some reasons to do this. Um, we, we want a more specific representation of uncertainty. And first of all, it's not clear to me that in that graph I showed you before that the full range of potential carbon cycle uncertainty is being represented. And I think that's something that the next generation Earth system models are going to really start to be able to explore. You know, if, do you have, if you have strong climate change feedbacks in some scenarios, do you get even higher scenarios than that? Um, or if, if with these improved data sets of land use change, you know, land use change is a dominant, you know, it really does supply a lot of the missing sink, then you don't have as many feedbacks in a positive direction. So um, we really, a regional, if, if still rather aggregate approach, will allow examination of impacts of specific physical scenarios, such as the Amazonian die off. You know, it, it wouldn't be that hard to, to parameterize in there the Amazon dying off and the carbon consequences of that, um, if, and then boreal forest carbon release. So in a sense, we can tell a more relevant story. And just sort of having these aggregate parameters, we can have a little bit more of a sense of what's going on. And that requires a sense, you know, what, what's outputting, being output from their system models. And we can compare the impact of different data sets, history, and other assumptions. And this is rather important, again, with uncertainty. Um, George has done historical data sets, and there's a historical data set from, um, that Johan is putting together. We can actually, well, let's put, put the different ones in and see how different they are, what the consequences are. I mean, you can do that in a system model, and maybe you will do some of that, but your ability to do that is obviously more limited just because it's, it's a much bigger undertaking. Um, analysis of region carbon, carbon stocks linked with economics. This is rather important to us because the regional effects, you know, the global carbon cycle, well, you know, you can go to you know, policymakers, they, they are interested in that, but if, I, if we can tell them, well, here's what's happening to the carbon cycle in the U.S., that's much more relevant. Um, and we can a little bit better relate or perhaps even calibrate, you know, our model to regional results to try to see if it's reasonable or at least um, if you have a more detailed regional assessment or, or analysis, you know, this gives more context for that. Um, we're interested in things like regional carbon sequestration potential. I mean, that's a clear interest. Um, and, and we want, and the other thing we can do is I think we'd be able to produce land use change projections that are consistent with, more consistent with specific or systems models. So, you know, this is what you said before. I mean, if I use the same land use history, if I use the same initial carbon stocks and MPP assumptions, 
then if I run that up to the present and I have a land use change going into the future, that makes it much easier to take that and downscale it back to something that would be a, um, you know, you get a clever geographer like Johan to, you know, do that, develop some rules and do that. And then I think that um, helps that process out a bit. So this is uh, next to the last slide. So this is just an example application of economics of the carbon cycle. And this is, uh, will appear in TELUS. And I do have an email queued up with a copy to you. You requested this. But if anybody else wants a copy, let me know. I'll send one to you. So of course, current and future behavior of the carbon cycle is uncertain. So this is actually, we've done what we were talking about before, albeit with a simple model, not relating to an earth system model. What these are, are three emissions paths for fossil emissions that lead to the same stabilization level at 550. So with three different levels of carbon cycle feedback. And it was the same spread you saw before, except applied to a stabilization scenario. So with different carbon cycle assumptions, these three emissions paths lead to this, would lead to the same stabilization level. And then what we do is say, well, let's, what does it cost in economic terms to stabilize the system at this level? And so, what we can calculate is the total mitigation cost. This is the discounted total policy cost discounted back to 2000 or 2005, actually, I think. So it ranges from $1 to $6 trillion. So the implications of uncertainty in the carbon cycle are not trivial. And then the question is, was that range, is this really the full range or not? And, well, we'll find out. I mean, we'll never find out for sure. You know, the real world can always be outside of your uncertainty bounds, but you know, we'll hopefully get a better sense of that as we move forward over the next few years. What do you mean by mitigation cost? Is it money that's just vanished, or is it money which is a cycle and would benefit to? Well, the it's as it's well? money that you have to spend to change the system from the least cost state. So you have a state of the system, energy economic system that supplies the services that people want at a certain cost. And then you have to spend money, the consumers have to spend more money to change the state to a lower carbon emission, emission state. And whether it's the consumers or the government, I mean, these are, this is an idealized model where, you know, it's ideal. So the costs are always going to be larger than this. I mean, always, because the real world is not that ideal. And then these costs are affected very, in a very large sense by technology. If I assume different technology assumptions, the cost can be much lower or even higher. So essentially, you know, this is, you know, your, your energy bill, your electricity bill going up, you know, in the carbon policy case, because you've got to pay more for your electricity to have more, have less carbon emitted as a result than you would have otherwise. I mean, coal, we do a lot of electricity with coal in the U.S. And it's a great way to generate electricity. It's relatively cheap, you know, aside from removal of, you know, a lot of mountains in West Virginia, but that's a different topic, um, not too happy with. I, so, so that's the integral over 100 years? Right, it's a discounted integral. So it's discounted at 6% per year. So um, the cost in 2100 are, so it's an economic calculation. So the cost in 2100 are reduced by a large factor relative to near-term costs. So in a sense, this is the money that if you were to take this amount and put it in the bank in 2000 and let, you know, and then you get a rate of, you know, the social rate of return on that money, that would cover the cost of the climate policy over the century. Can we compare this cost to the cost of mitigation, which is in the Crutzen paper, which was 25 billion US dollars per year? Um, no, because that's a, you'd have to actually discount that back to a net present value. And the reason we do the discounting is that I can also show a path of carbon price over time and so on. So that's, that's, the, that's the way to get one number to compare. So you'd have to discount that back as well. And I don't know what that answer would be, but. We're not even sure what year the dollars are. There. Right, right. One would, you know, I, I haven't looked at the paper yet. So one could compare it. I just. You know, not off the top of my head, though. So, I mean, my question is, is this a large number? Yes. It's a large number. It's not an impossibly large number. I mean, it's, um, you know, and I actually had a different slide where I should have put this up here of um, comparing this to different. Um, I mean, the budget, U.S. budget is, you know, on the order of. Yeah, the GDP's on the 
it's a fraction of GDP over this time period. So it's actually only, it's may, you know, maybe a percent of global GDP integrated over this period. So it's actually not a large number. But it does, but it, if you look at it in terms of, you know, an expenditure, it would be one of the larger expen single expenditures that, you know, governments would have. So it, it's a big change. But it's not impossible. I mean, but the U.S. spends five hundred billion on armed forces and right. every right. year. So, yeah. <clears throat> so that would be a fraction of that. Yeah. But that fraction would have to come out of something that's being spent now. So you know, sure. it, so that's always the trick. Tom Schilling. Yeah. So. So just sort of summarizing a little bit, I mean, I, I think there does need to be more interaction between the Earth system model and integrated assessment models. And actually, the previous speaker, I think, said much the same thing, so that's nice to see. Um, particularly in terms of carbon cycle, land use, land use change, and chemistry. Um, for example, you know, regional air pollution statistics, you know, if we were to start to get that back, you know, if that were something that could be produced, then we can start to check consistency with socioeconomic scenarios that we're used to generate the emissions. Um, I think this interaction will result in improved emissions information for their system models with carbon cycle and land use results more consistent from the historical to future periods. And we want to do think about improved spatial gridding of emissions to, to start to do, do that as well. And that was one of the things we talked about earlier. And I think on the other way around, our system model results can be used to improve the ability of integrated assessment models to examine a wider range of potential states of the Earth system. So the reason, you know, the, you know, our model, although in some cases we can do this, for the most part, it's not the purpose of our models to determine all the possible states, but, you know, we draw from the different disciplinary research, and then we can look at the implications of these states. And some of the things that we're interested in are, you know, initial future vegetation states, vegetation changes in carbon stocks, um, and compare the consequences of results from different Earth systems and models, as we do now for the climate sensitivity. But as these new generation of models get more nuanced, we want to do that for the other dimensions that the models are now able to explore. So, thanks.